Northern Idaho's newest attraction, Silverwood Theme Park, is home to a turn-of-the-century mining town, complete with an authentic steam engine train with a 3.2-mile circular run, and a museum filled with over $3 million worth of antique airplanes. Built around a functioning airport, air shows are a big attraction on weekends, drawing scores of people from around the United States and Canada. Silverwood is also home to an active 74-year-old who loves what she does. To Gladys Baroker, the word flight means something very special. With 56 years of flying behind her, she's managed to take to the air in one form or another and master it well enough to teach others. I feel that I've lived in the very best period of time uh, possible as far as aviation goes. I didn't get in at the very beginning, but I got in when it was new enough so that I've seen a lot of progress and more or less grew along with it. It actually takes no effort at all uh, to fly a glider. I, I say that now, and I know you can look at me and with this disbelief, but it's like anything else. It's, um, it's doing it enough. I would compare it to um, uh, sailboating. If you've ever been out on a sailboat, you know how uh, relaxed and quiet and that it can be, and I feel gliding is the same way. I graduated from high school at age 17, and immediately I was on my own, out and had a job and started working, and of course I had had a love for flying uh, as long as I can remember, but I had a little different uh, home life than a lot of children and I wasn't able to share my love of flying with my family because I'm sure they would have been, well I know they would have been against it. Growing up in Ferndale, Washington, Gladys began her flying career in 15 minute lessons once a week. She learned on an airstrip that could double as a cow pasture and in 1932 she soloed in a water-cooled OX-5 Waco 10 biplane in what was then billed as a record-setting achievement for a woman. She had completed her instruction in a combined time of just under five hours. The fellows that had the airport um, had built a parachute. In fact, the fellow that my instructor had built this parachute himself, and uh, they tested it by uh, rolling it off of a, <coughs> uh, a sack of grain off of the wing and then see if the chute would open, and it did, and so then they uh, started jumping it. Well, they had exhibition jumps on about every weekend, and of course, right off, I wanted to jump, you know, and uh, they wouldn't let me. And of course, I uh, was a little upset about that and kept tormenting them and finally realized that they were not going to let me jump. And so I said, well, if you won't let me jump, I'm going to go someplace else where I can jump. <laughs> By that time, I had uh, bought myself a motorcycle, and uh, that was my transportation. So I, on a day off, I went to Seattle and went out to Boeing Field and started asking around about parachute jumping and that. And Someone that I talked to said, well, yeah, Jim Galvin's getting ready to go barnstorming, and I don't think he's got a jumper yet. Before very long, Gladys had signed herself up to a contract to make 20 jumps on a tour of eastern Washington state without ever having jumped before. It was a real strange feeling. I've never been able to explain it to anyone exactly how you feel, unless it's maybe uh, swimming in the nude or something. You're just so free. and. Then as I got within about a thousand feet of the ground, it just looked like I was standing still and the earth was just coming up to meet me. So it was, uh, it was a different experience and I wouldn't have missed it for anything. The tour was going great until the 17th jump. Her parachute collapsed from the turbulence of another plane taking off, causing her to hit the ground with enough force to injure her knee. It ended her jumping career. 
By the fall of 1936, Gladys, who was then working as a waitress, talked a friend of hers into joining her on what turned out to be a long journey. It was billed as a promotional trip for the city of Bellingham, Washington. Aboard motorcycles, the two spent three months on the road, stopping at all the major cities in the United States, as well as Canada and Mexico. Following the tour, and a marriage to her former flight instructor, Herb Baroker, Gladys settled in Olympia, Washington. That led to a teaching job in nearby Lacey at St. Martin's College in 1937. While she was there training students for the U.S. government in a program called civilian pilot training, Pearl Harbor was bombed. The government then closed all civilian flying on the West Coast, forcing the Barokers inland in 1941. So we moved um, into Pasco, and we were there probably eight months, and uh, then the Navy came and decided they wanted to use Pasco, so that uh, meant we had to move again. So we moved to Coeur d'Alene, and uh, we uh, set up our flight operation at Weeks Field, which, by the way, is the first municipally owned airport in the United States. After we came to Coeur d'Alene and we started training, then they changed uh, the program from civilian pilot training to uh, war training service. And then uh, it was a different contract, and we were uh, assigned students uh, from the military. While at Weeks Field, Gladys taught many students, from beginners to advanced. Some included naval officers, given aerobatic instruction to obtain their licenses to teach and train cadets in aerobatics and preparation for combat. The Barokers moved to Athol, Idaho and purchased some land with their friend Clay Henley in 1971 and started an airstrip eventually known as the Henley Airdrome. The property was eventually sold to Gary Norton, who upgraded the airstrip and added a theme park. Today, Gladys spends most of her time teaching gliding and she occasionally drops in on her friends Bob Sleep and Walt Redfern while they put on the finishing touches on their replica of a German World War I albatross. <laughs> 